Welcome to Open Studio, WGBH's weekly spotlight on arts and culture from around the region and the nation. I'm Jared Bowen, coming up on Open Studio, Visions of Utopia. Right now, amid COVID, amid different crises, we are seeing a regeneration of utopian energy. Then the architect creating landmarks built on justice. I think a, a successful memorial space allows you to connect directly to that individual who, in this case, was brutally murdered. Try to see who they were as a human being. Plus, a makeover for the Mayflower. Come on aboard, Jared. Uh, let's go aboard Mayflower, too. I'm sure it never gets old for you. Not at all. It's all now on Open Studio. First up, Walden, Thoreau, Emerson, New England has been rich in fertile ground and thinkers. At the Decor of a Sculpture Park and Museum, the contemplation continues with a look at how artists define utopia. New England is dotted with the clapboard shelters of thought. The old manse where Ralph Waldo Emerson sussed out spirituality in nature. Orchard House, where Louisa May Alcott's father Bronson treaded a transcendentalist path. And Fruitlands, Alcott's short-lived utopian commune. Throughout New England, particularly in Massachusetts, there were a number of agrarian settlements who lived communally and strive for a better working society on a small scale. It's the belief of Sarah Montross, curator of the exhibition Visionary New England at the Decor of a Sculpture Park and Museum, that those utopian notions linger here, taking root today via a host of contemporary artists. Sarah, this is gorgeous on the surface, but tell me what's happening here. So we are standing amid an installation of photography and a floor piece by the New Haven artist Kim Weston. Kim designed this array of incredible photographs activated by a memorial. You're looking at thousands of red silk tobacco bundles and each of these signifies a life lost. So the memorial is to women and children of Native American descent who suffer much higher degrees of violence, disappearance, and death. Behind us are large-scale photographs printed on metal that Kim took at various powwows throughout New England that Kim and her family are a part of. The spirit energy of the ancestor or the deity who's inhabited by the performers is expressed through Kim's work. Here you'll find the traditional trappings of transcendentalism, like Henry David Thoreau's pencils, but also new sculpture by artist Sam Durant. It stems from 2016 when the California-based artist stationed himself in Concord at the Old Manse. Durant built the outline of a home reflecting those of Concord's first free black men and women. The installation became a meeting place for public conversation and is resurrected here along with this sculpture of fused furniture. A desk representing 18th century black poet Phyllis Wheatley morphed with a recreation of Emerson's chair. Both of these pieces of furniture, that which these writers, these creators, these world builders would have sat and put pen to paper, are now being shown in dialogue and in fact supporting one another. In gallery upon gallery, artists in the exhibition interrogate utopian ideals. The vibrant paintings of the late artist Paul Laffoley are like diagrams for transcendence, Montrose says. While artist Michael Medores envision a future world after climate change. Utopian thought emerges during particularly contested historic epochs. And so I do think right now, amid COVID, amid different crises, we are seeing a regeneration of utopian energy. The artists who I was interested in, who I found interesting in our collection, were invested in social progress. Sam Adams is the curator of the companion show Transcendental Modernism, which presents artists from the museum's collection who crafted their own 20th century take on the theme. Overall, I would have to say they're darker. You know, the show opens with exiles and emigres who are escaping Nazi Europe. The development of mysticism in their art is different, but it meets up with the same strands from transcendentalist thinkers from the 19th century. Adams says for some of the artists, including poet Gary Rickson, the spirituality comes in the actual making. For him, painting this is a very charged experience where he's channeling these words that have come to him. For more than 200 years, America's thought leaders, writers, and artists have charted paths to utopia. But as this exhibition reminds us, 
none have made it there. What is utopia? Oh, it's such a great, great question. Hard to answer. I think utopia is a concept, a ideal that is never achieved. Next, compelled to think beyond big, shiny, attention-grabbing buildings, architect Michael Murphy has posed the question, what more can architecture do? He is founding principal and executive director of Mass Design Group, which has built schools in Rwanda, hospitals in Haiti, and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. The team's philosophy for design, building, and living is documented in the new book, Justice is Beauty. Michael Murphy, thank you so much for being with us. Congratulations on the monograph. Thank you, Jared. Great to be here. I really appreciate you taking some time. Well, of course. So in this monograph, we see 10 years of Mass Design Group's work, uh, buildings all over the world, big, small. Uh, how, do you, how do you distill what the essence, the spirit of your design is, especially hearkening back to the title, Justice is Beauty? I think they all share a fundamental belief that the role of architecture is really to guide us towards um, spaces that uh, deliver better health care, it'd be that better airflow from, say, something like the coronavirus, uh, inspire us to believe in something greater about ourselves and our community, a kind of spiritual awakening, and also sometimes address really fundamental problems in um, uh, in our countries, for example, around memorials or landscapes of injustice, that we can actually address them through the through the built environment. A lot of your projects, you go to a community, wherever it is in the world, sometimes places you've never been before, you sit down in that community, you spend time, months there, you get to know the community. So in the end, who is the architect? Or is, is there an architect or is it the community? I think that's a great question. I think you, know, you see this in hospital design. You know, if you don't talk to the nurses, you're never going to see, you know, who who the real designers are. These are the folks that are every day seeing that there's problems not only in the building but in their in their machines or in in the tools that they have. There is design happening everywhere, and I think the role of the architect is really um, as a steward, as uh, a listener, to try to find where those moments are and inspire them into something more dramatic, and to also present not what people want, but what people need, you know, to, to listen really intently and then to work with a team of folks who are trained in the built environment to say, how does that translate to uh, uh, an infrastructure, a spatial solution that addresses the needs that we see being demanded, even non-verbally from people within the community that we're serving? We've talked a lot about health. Of course, we're in a, a health crisis now with the coronavirus, with this pandemic. But you've already done work in communities and countries where there have there have been outbreaks of disease. Uh, so in a way, I guess you're kind of prepared for this. And as you take a step back, do, how well does architecture stand up, uh, perhaps in places like the United States, against a pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think our experience in the past was a lot of times in pandemic. You know, we worked with tuberculosis in Rwanda, we worked with cholera in Haiti, we worked with Ebola in Liberia. And I think in each of those cases, designing for the limit case condition of the surge, of the like most problematic ultimate failure that we might see, turns out to solve a lot of other problems as well. Now the whole world is aware, everybody in the world is aware that the buildings around us are keeping us from uncontaminated air. And that that is a spatial awakening that I believe we're all undergoing right now that could radically transform not only our built environment around us, the buildings that are built, but what we demand of them. Switching gears a little bit, you've designed some very indelible memorials uh, uh, worldwide, uh, Holocaust Memorial, and very, very notably here, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. Other people know it as the Memorial to Victims of Lynchings in this country. How do you, if, looking at the, the lynching memorial in particular, how do you use space to, to begin to understand how to create something uh, of that magnitude with all solemnity? Well, first of all, you know, all credit for the memorial for peace and, to peace and justice goes to Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative. I mean, they truly have transformed the way we understand uh, 
our, our history of terrorism, racial terror, our history of the recreation and resubstantiation of racial difference. And we took very seriously the journey that Brian Stevenson in his theory of change talks about. He talks about we must go through a transformation ourselves in order to understand the history of lynching. And it's been really transformative for the way I understand buildings more generally, that they're, you know, they're not sculptures, they're, uh, they're experiences. How much do you consider emotion with, a mor with memorials? I, I'm, I'm desperate to get there myself. I still haven't been there, but in the videos that I have seen, in photographs I've seen from your own book, you, you see the emotions on people's faces. Is, it, is that something that you design around? I think a, a successful memorial space allows you to connect directly to that individual who, in this case, was brutally murdered or um, in the public square, for example. Connect to their name, try to find their history, understand them as a human being and not just as a number, as, a, as a, someone listed on a spreadsheet. You know, to try to see who they were as a human being, their dignity. That's the hardest thing a memorial can do. But the other thing a memorial has to do is make us feel the weight of the infinite, that innumerable, unaccountable loss that we can't even fully reckon with. And that's that sense of the hugeness of it, the volume of it. And if it deals with both of those, you can connect directly and also feel that infinite sense, that the innumerable weight, the overwhelmingness of it. I believe the memorial is work on both planes. Well, with that in mind, then, take us through the experience that we will have right here in Boston with the memorial to Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, uh, in the city where they met. Uh, your memorial will be on Boston Common. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. We haven't really had a chance to talk about that. But so let me do this. I haven't done this before. But, you know, first of all, uh, what you're going to see when you come to the Common is this incredible sculpture by the amazing Hank Willis Thomas. And the sculpture is gonna is really it's coming out of the ground and it's two hands uh, two arms wrapped around each other and the, it's from an image of Coretta and Martin hugging and embracing each other uh, after he won the Nobel Peace Prize after it was announced and um, so you're going to see these arms these elbows leaning on the ground this huge sculpture that you can walk within it's going to be a beacon but as you get closer we've very de very deliberately designed the experience of the ground and we have uh, designed the plaza, which this sculpture sits upon, as a memorial to the 1965 Freedom March that King led with uh, Ralph Abernathy and other great Boston civic leaders, civil rights leaders of the time. And here we have a chance to say, they hold us up. And these great heroes are only possible because of so many of their voices and their activism. Uh, and we give them reverence and give them space. Michael Murphy, thank you so much. Justice is Beauty. It's a fantastic book. Thank you for being with us. We're grateful for the time. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you all. Book your passage to India. It's time now for Arts This Week. Sunday, the American Repertory Theater gets poetic with Anthem, a virtual performance exploring issues of race, gender, and politics from the perspective of trans women. Catch Glories of the Paroque, a special streaming concert from Handel and Haydn Society, Tuesday. Anna is looking at you, kid. Thursday, Casablanca turns 78. The film had its world premiere in New York City and went on to win Best Picture at the Academy Awards. Bogart was nominated, but went home empty-handed. Friday explore more than 100 paintings, sculptures, and photographs in the Peabody Essex Museum's three newest galleries dedicated to India and its people. Worcester Art Museum presents its first digital exhibition of historic and contemporary kimonos. Kimono Couture, The Beauty of Chizo, goes online Saturday. As we head into Thanksgiving, we also remember that this is the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims landing on these shores, arriving from England aboard the Mayflower. Its full-scale replica at Mayflower 2 was just added to the National Register of Historic Places. Here's another look at a piece we brought you earlier this fall. In Plymouth Harbor, Mayflower 2 is the embodiment of promise. A full-scale replica of the ship that delivered pilgrims to American shores where they expected to establish religious freedom. 
It was a Greyhound bus of its error. It was just a ship that a group of people had hired to get them to what they thought would be Virginia and ended up being New England. Today, though, it's an indelible part of this nation's founding. And on the 400th anniversary of that famous sailing, Mayflower 2 has just undergone a three-year, multi-million dollar restoration. What do you see when you look at the Mayflower 2? Uh, the American story that for me, Mayflower is a memory device and it is a symbol. For someone that has direct family ties to that ship, it may mean one thing. For an indigenous person, it may have another meaning. The ship is operated by nearby Plymouth Plantation, where Richard Pickering is deputy executive director. The historic site recreates life during those first precarious years as the pilgrims settled here. Although Plymouth Plantation's name is changing. We wanted to make certain that the Wampanoag voice, the indigenous voice, was as important as the English voice, so we have become Plymouth Patuxent Museums. Back to the Mayflower 2, it gleams once again, and more importantly, it's staying afloat, says Captain Whit Perry. When I first took the job before we did the restoration, the bilge pump would be coming on seven or eight times a day to pump out the water coming in. And of course, the first, first rule of any boat or ship is keep the water on the outside. The ship's restoration happened at Mystic Seaport Museum in Connecticut, where a team of shipwrights and artisans restored the ship's sails, wood, and metal parts, sometimes even using 17th century tools. No one was just coming to work to punch a time card. Everybody took a vested interest. Come on aboard, Jared. Uh, let's go aboard Mayflower 2. I'm sure it never gets old for you. Not at all. Like a kid still excited to show off his new toy, Perry took me around the ship, pointing out the paint colors, bright combinations chosen so sailors could identify ships from afar, and the tween deck, where more than 100 pilgrim passengers were relegated for their 66-day crossing. It's kind of like no umbrella drinks and a carnival cruise for those folks in 1620. So quarantined, but no social distancing. Exactly. Perry points out where restoration has happened, like on this windlass, which hoists the anchor, and where whole sections of the ship have been fully replaced. An expedition all its own, with wood sourced from around the world. We actually started coining the phrase from tree to sea. We would start right with the log in the woods, and one of my favorite parts was going out in the woods with a spray can to pick the trees right out of the forest. Steering the Mayflower was nearly as complicated. You can see that we can't really see much out here at all. So how do you steer the ship? Certainly they would have had a magnetic compass and the helmsman would be down here, but if you look at this hatch grating, the officer of the deck would be giving steering commands from up on the half deck. Mayflower 2 was gifted to the U.S. by England in 1957, a thank you for American support during World War II. It crossed the Atlantic then and set sail again on the open sea this summer as it returned from Connecticut. Perry captained the ship with a crew of 27. Is it peaceful? Oh yeah, yep, it's all of those romantic sounds that we all know and love from movies of the creaking of the rigging, the wood working against each other as the ship moves like a living thing and twists and moves what it's meant to do. There's one sound though, which Perry says for the occasional visitor who also happened to have emceed the ship's launch ceremony in Connecticut. Jared, thank you very much for showing an interest in Mayflower. I think you should uh, ring our bell for us, uh, the Mayflower bell. All right, we're done. Do you want to get down and all into it? What we're going to do, it's about 1 o'clock, so that would be two bells on the sailor's watch schedule. So if you'll give it a ding, ding, that will let the sailors know that it's 1 o'clock. All right, here it goes. One o'clock, and all is well, and as it was. In Colorado Springs, Colorado, sits a castle. Built in the early 1870s, it's a testament to a different time and personality. It's this rugged place 
at the foot of the Rocky Mountains with an English style castle <laughs> right in the heart of it. It's a little shocking the first time you come to the grounds. It's so beautifully constructed. It almost is perfection and it looks like it's been here for hundreds of years. I think the way that you come into Glen Erie on this winding road up a canyon and there at the back this castle is situated looking like it's always been here. The thing that makes Glen Erie Canyon so powerful is, you know, it's part of the same geology as Garden of the Gods. The Garden of the Gods landscape um, consists of, of course, the large famous red rock formations. There are different colors of sandstones and conglomerates and, and granite that were actually uh, uplifted during the mountain building process of Pikes Peak. So as the mountain built, sandstones got tilted vertically. You don't really see the sandstone spires until you get here. The canyon opens up to you as you arrive at the castle and continues on. It's a beautiful place and it draws many, many people and always has. One person enraptured by the views was General William Jackson Palmer, who came to the region on a railroad surveying trip in 1869. After marrying his wife, Queen, they returned to the area and soon began construction on their dream home. John Blair, the landscape architect, saw an eagle's nest or an eyrie on the side of a beautiful rock here and gave the name Glen Erie to this space. The carriage house at Glen Erie was built in 1871. It was the first building built on the property, and William and his new wife, Queen, lived in the upper stories while they were waiting for their main house to be built. The original Glen Erie was a Gothic-style house. It was built in the form of a Latin cross, and it had about 27 rooms. It was built on the banks of Camp Creek that flows from the mountains down the Glen Erie Valley. Years of expansions and renovations created the estate we know today. After Palmer's death, Glen Erie was eventually purchased by the Navigators, an international ministry, becoming a conference center. The region has long been affected by natural disasters, including fires and floods. While surveying a site for flood mitigation work, the city of Colorado Springs lead archaeologist Anna Cordova stumbles upon something left behind, the site of Palmer's trash dump. This is where one man's trash became a treasure for local historians. Context is everything in archaeology, and I started thinking of, you know, what am I close to? Who was living in this area at the time? An archaeology dig of this nature is actually very rare. To find more about Palmer over 100 years after he's gone. It's once in a lifetime. You can't tell a lot about one particular family in a public dump because lots of families are putting their trash in those places. The really unique thing about this site is that everything that's out there we know came from this estate, which is apparently a really rare thing in archaeology. There are a number of artifacts that we actually recovered were about 65,000. We have looked at every one of those artifacts. We have recovered and identified probably at least 50 different types of ceramics. Buttons, forks, knives, cooking utensils, cups, stemware, liquor bottles, pipes, flower pots, lots of different animal bones, wooden furniture pieces. We just uh, identified a tree cleat, which was really interesting. A cleat that you attach to the toe so you could climb the trees. There's also industrial items, so fire hose. We also have bottles that went into early fire extinguishers. Photographic equipment, so we have dark room elements. There's a lot of medicinal things too, as well as medicine bottles, medicine jars, vials for homeopathic type of medicines. And a lot of people ask why we care about trash, um, why it matters, but trash can tell you a whole lot about households and people. It can speak sometimes even to ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, gender. It can answer so many questions that will talk about the daily lives of these people. So what they ate, what they wore, what they read. It's unedited and that's where its power lies because it's literally the raw material of their lives out here at Glen Erie. For example, we now know that Palmer really liked Worcestershire sauce. Apparently, there are many, many Worcestershire bottles. 
We're seeing very few items in the scheme of thousands that we have looked at that are domestically produced. Most everything that we're finding is being imported. I think that's another evidence of his wealth. I've got some mineral water from Budapest, even though he had some mineral water right next door in Manitou Springs. As far as historic archaeology goes, it's probably one of the most significant finds that, that we've had, definitely in Colorado Springs in the Pikes Peak region. Archaeology is important in that it connects us to the past. I think that helps people to form connections with those places. And I think if you're connected to those places, you take care of them more as well. Having an English Tudor castle in the Colorado hillside helps remind us how people have continued to reshape Colorado over time in their own vision. This place remains as a symbol of those dreams, visions, and ideas of that founding generation of Colorado settlement. And that is all for this edition of Open Studio. Next week, the Tony nominations are out, and we look at two of this year's most nominated shows, Jagged Little Pill and Moulin Rouge, the musical. Until then, I'm Jared Bowen. Thanks for joining us. And on behalf of all of us at Open Studio, we wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. And as always, you can visit us online at gbh.org slash openstudio, and you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at OpenStudioGBH. Thank you.